All right, morning everybody. My name is David Rickless and I'm a master's student at uh, University of Georgia in the geography department. So uh, my work deals pretty broadly with vulnerability to natural hazards, how we represent it, and uh, how it's produced and experienced. Uh, but I have a background in GIS and spatial analysis. So it uh, puts me in an interesting uh, disciplinary space. And today I'm going to be talking about a uh, particular approach that I'm taking to the issue of coastal hazard vulnerability. And it takes inspiration from critical GIS thinking while uh, trying to maintain a solid foothold in some more uh, conventional mapping uh, techniques. So I'd originally intended for this talk to be uh, more about the design aspect and uh, representing qualitative uh, data visually, but ended up that the project is not actually at that stage yet. So that's just how it goes sometimes uh, with research. So this talk is going to be fairly conceptual, a little bit of a change of pace maybe, uh, going to deal with the role of cartography in constructing and interpreting this idea of vulnerability. So the thinking behind this research comes from three main branches of theory, uh, social vulnerability, critical GIS, and local or embodied knowledge. I'm going to break these down one by one and then try to draw them back together. So I'd like to start by defining what I actually mean by vulnerability to natural hazards because it has a different connotation depending on what your background is. Or maybe you haven't ever uh, thought of uh, natural disasters and hazards in this way at all. So here I'm focusing on coastal flood hazards. Flooding on the coast is uh, most obviously associated with tropical storm events, which of course cause catastrophic flooding from storm surges, and uh, as we saw with Hurricane Harvey, intense rainfall in one place. But another form of flooding, uh, which is sometimes called nuisance flooding, is uh, describe situations where normal rainfall or tidal events cause floods that aren't catastrophic, but still interfere with everyday life. So maybe in this case your house isn't destroyed, but the road that you have to drive on to get to work every day is uh, underwater. And these situations are becoming increasingly common along the coast as uh, the sea level rises, and uh, they're causing trouble in places that won't be permanently inundated for a long time. So this is uh, generally my focus, this idea that it's becoming increasingly difficult to live along the coast, yet at the same time, uh, obviously lots and lots of people do, so uh, how are they going to respond uh, by migrating, by adapting, and how is that going to be differentiated? Now when I say vulnerability, I'm largely talking about social vulnerability. So it's pretty well established that the adverse effects of what we call natural hazards, floods, earthquakes, uh, et cetera, are unevenly distributed. Uh, this is, that's a that's, you know, pretty classic geographical idea. This is partly a function of physical location, of course, but it's inherently related to social processes. And I have a classic quote here that sums it up. Uh, it says, it is acknowledged among geographers that there is no such thing as a natural disaster. In every phase or aspect of a disaster, causes, vulnerability, preparedness, results in response, and reconstruction, the contours of disaster, and I really like that phrasing, and the differences between who lives and who dies is to a greater or lesser extent a social calculus. So Neil Smith wrote this following Hurricane Katrina, but I would argue that it applies to less devastating events just as well. And these days, pretty much all studies of vulnerability understand it to be a social phenomenon or to at least have an essential social component. All right, so here's some maps. There is an impressive body of work, I think, that tries to quantitatively represent and visualize these factors that influence vulnerability and map them to uh, predict differences in recovery. For example, uh, the social vulnerability indices developed by Susan Cutter and by the CDC combine physical and demographic measures of exposure into a numerical score. That's what's uh, represented on the left here. And uh, some recent work by Howard Evans and Mishra, which actually came out of UGA, use sea level rise predictions and forecasts of population change to estimate how many people would be displaced by sea level rise. It's quite a lot. 
So this is the backdrop against which my work takes place. And my contribution is what I hope will be an interesting application of geographic theory in this area. And that brings me to the second part of my framework, which is critical GIS. Now I think uh, critical cartography and GIS um, may be familiar to a lot of you, so I'm going to focus on the aspects that I think are most relevant to what I'm actually doing. So I'm drawing on two of the major points that critical cartography makes. One is that maps are not actually objective, but reflect the partialities of their designers. And the second is that they help actively produce the spaces that they represent. And so I, I think these are really uh, interesting concepts that I could spend a long time talking about, but I'm going to leave it at that uh, for now. I'll be happy to talk more later if anyone's interested. And uh, critical GIS then to a large extent applies this thinking to geospatial technology, right? So it asks questions about the role of GIS in society and what it means for GIS to be given the authority that it is. Uh, I think anyone who's ever made a map um, and, and like introduce it to somebody has had that experience where you put data on a map and people generally assume that it's correct. Um, at least that's my experience. If something is on a map, people trust a map. And that's not a bad thing, but it's something we need to be conscious of as we're, um, as we're presenting data and information in a certain way. So there's been an interesting dialogue going on there. And for my purposes, one of the key ideas that emerged from it is that social scientists who use GIS should be aware of the communities they're studying and try to bring those folks' needs into the foreground. Now this isn't a new concept. It's existed for a while in uh, science and technology studies and feminist geography. They've been questioning the idea of objectivity and have argued that we should embrace the partiality of knowledge, use it to emphasize the perspectives of people who are not scientists. And those people have at times been uh, marginalized in the scientific conversation. I do think there's still some big uh, epistemological differences there that I'm not going to wade into, but in general I think people like me with a background in GIS are becoming more receptive to this notion of elevating local knowledge. And that's a good thing. I think you could say it just as easily for uh, cartography. So what this means for vulnerability mapping is that we need to look closely at our representations and what they actually mean for the places and the people that we're studying. Obviously, we uh, don't expect a map drawn from aggregated data to capture the richness of variation that you would see in real life. But since GIS models are used to guide some really important decisions, especially with regard to natural disasters and natural hazards, I think it's important to understand where and how the model or the map diverges from people's experiences. Because people do know how they experience something like a flood. They understand that uh, in a different way than scientists maybe, but I would argue in a way that's worth considering. And what I'm suggesting here is that do, by doing this, we can at the very least lend some context to uh, cartographic representations and GIS models of vulnerability. And possibly we can produce some insights that will influence the design of these models going forward. So the concept I'm developing here is to consider a more conventional geospatial study alongside non-expert knowledge and to find where they're similar, where they diverge. As the work progresses, I'm going to engage with some community members and better understand how well the social vulnerability index represents their experiences. Uh, to do this, I'm going to be working with, well, I'm currently working with the survey and I will soon be working with some interview data as well. So I have access to a geo-reference survey of about 800 people along the coast of Georgia. It asks questions about their, uh, about their uh, perception of tropical storms and sea level rise and their plans for adaptation. And then I'm in the process of uh, setting up some interviews to go more in depth. So hopefully the result will add some context to the social vulnerability index that I'm working with. And I think it's an interesting exercise uh, in engaged research anyway. Now, uh, running a little short on time, so I'm going to uh, go ahead and wrap up in a minute here. Uh, I do need, of course, I need to acknowledge that doing this type of work brings to mind some really difficult questions uh, regarding engaged research. What is the community? 
how are we defining that? How should we interface with them as scholars or as uh, GIS and uh, cartography practitioners? And uh, how does this community-derived knowledge interact with the more authoritative forms of knowledge that we might be used to seeing at an official level? So I'm closing with a pair of quotes here that illustrate where I'm interested in going with GIS-based vulnerability research. The first one sums up the sentiment of many vulnerability scholars, and then the second one deals with the role of critical GIS and the need to be self-critical about our claims as researchers. So clearly there's more complexity here than I can address right now, uh, but it's a discussion I'm really interested to be a part of, that's why I'm here. Uh, alongside the, the comment about reflexivity there, I think it's uh, important to get input from the diversity of people that we have here. So uh, definitely share your thoughts with me. I do want to acknowledge some folks that have helped me get access to data I wouldn't have otherwise and have, uh, are currently helping me on the project as advisors or in other capacities. Uh, and yeah, if you have any questions, I'd be, love to talk. And if we don't have time, shoot me an email. Or I added this yesterday because everybody was putting their Twitter handle on here. So uh, feel free to tweet at me. Thank you very much.